Mayor David Darkowitz, and I really welcome you and thank you for coming out to this evening's Town Hall budget meeting. Uh, just by way of background, this is one of six Town Hall budget meetings that I'm trying to do across the city uh, as I prepare to put together my uh, first city budget for 2013. Uh, just a quick bit of process. So uh, each year the mayor needs to present to the city council uh, in May um, a balanced city budget uh, that funds all of our various uh, city programs. Uh, and the city council then has to consider that. Um, they hold hearings on it. And then they must take a final vote uh, before the start of the new fiscal year on July 1st. Uh, that's our fiscal years, unlike calendar years and federal years, run from July 1st to June 30th. So one of the reasons I wanted to have these meetings around the city was to really give people some background on the budget formulation process, give you some information about some of the pressures that we're facing in this year's budget, and mainly to get feedback and ideas from citizens uh, about what your priorities are for the budget, uh, about what your ideas are for the budget, so that I can try to incorporate all that information, as well as the information I'm gathering when I meet with department heads, uh, when I meet with uh, when I meet with other folks around the city, my financial team, to try to put together that budget. So before I open it up to sort of a conversation, I did want to give you some background information. So I've got the, uh, a PowerPoint that I've put together with some information. Um, this is sort of a, you won't be able to read every number, but this just sort of gives you the, the bigger picture of the overall city budget, uh, which is our uh, general fund budget plus the three enterprise funds that we have. So it's a, about a $93 million budget. Uh, the general fund, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is primarily the budget that I have to present to the city council. Um, but then you'll see that we have these three separate enterprises for our sewer system, for our water system, and for our solid waste system, which is our, our transfer station and landfill. Those are run as sort of separate businesses where fees come in and the fees go out to support the system. Uh, there are some charges over to the city side, which we'll talk about. Um, but I just wanted to give you sort of the big picture, but for our purposes, what I'm going to be talking about mostly tonight um, is the general fund. And I'm going to start first with, uh, with the revenue side. So this is a pie chart of the uh, general fund, and you'll see that of that nearly 77 million, about 60.3% of the revenues is in taxes. So this would be your property taxes, this would be excise taxes, this would be meals taxes, uh, hotel taxes, any of the forms of taxes that we are allowed to collect under state law. The next number you'll see is the state revenue cherry sheet. Uh, that's the aid that we receive from uh, the state government each year as part of their budget. It's called the cherry sheet because back in the day, before computers, they used to literally give us that number on a pink sheet. And, and so it was given the name the cherry sheet. And even though they do it all electronically now, they still call it the cherry sheet. So that's where that name comes from. So that's about 20%, 20.8%. Charges for services is largely, that's largely made up of what we charge tuition for Smith Vocational School. Um, we don't have very many other charges. Fines and forfeitures, obviously, uh, parking tickets, uh, licenses and permits, if you get a building permit, if you get an electrical permit, those kinds of things, you get a license for your dog, those are all the things that go into that. Interfund operating transfers, that's 6.3%. That those are the monies that come from those three enterprise funds and come over to the general fund budget to pay for services that we provide on the general fund side, whether it's financial, accounting, uh, et cetera, uh, that we then charge the, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, enterprise funds. So then we'll take a quick look um, at some of the other factors. So property tax revenue. This shows you a chart uh, basically a 10-year span from fiscal year 2003 to fiscal year 2012. As we know, in Massachusetts, we have Proposition 2.5, which means that each year, uh, cities and towns across Massachusetts can only raise their uh, property taxes by 2.5%. That's what we're allowed to by law, without going out to the voters uh, to seek an override. Uh, so, and then, of course, the other piece of that so this, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the next part of it, but basically you can see that property taxes have essentially gone up following that 2.5% increase every year. Um, the upper line is the actual, uh, the, the lower line is adjusted for inflation. You can see this little, uh, this spike that occurred right here around between 2008-2009, or actually 2009-2010, 
that's when we passed the general override uh, in 2009, where we basically allowed, the voters allowed us to increase that base levy by $2 million. So you can see there was a slight increase in that particular year. So that just shows where the revenues are. Looking at what that translates into in actual uh, tax rates, this is a comparison of Northampton uh, versus a group of neighboring communities that we've selected because of similar size budgets, similar size communities. This is the tax rate per thousand dollars. So when you get your tax bill, you'll see, you'll get that final total, but it's based on a thousand dollars per value of your property. So thirteen dollars and thirty-five cents per one thousand. And you can see how Northampton compares, uh, you know, with Longmeadow uh, at nineteen dollars and sixty-eight cents per one thousand, uh, all the way down to where we are, and then East Hampton behind us. So that kind of gives you the range of how our tax rates compare. This is what the average property value is relative to those other um, comparison communities. Uh, this shows you again the state average for the average property in Massachusetts is 358,586. You see Northampton is at 304,422. That's what an average property in Northampton is valued at. And then you can sort of see where we where we fit on that continuum. This shows you now what an average single family tax bill looks like. Again, comparing ourselves to these other communities. The state average uh, for fiscal year 11, so the average single family tax bill was $4,537 a year. You can see that Northampton is at $4,064. And then you can see again that continuum of the comparison communities and where we stack up uh, compared to others. This is probably the most important slide uh, in the presentation, or at least the one that tells the, big, the biggest story about where we've come and where we are right now over those 10 years. You can basically see in, in fiscal year 2003, this is state aid. So this is the, that aid that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation that we received for schools, for general government, lottery, all that. Basically, when we send our tax dollars to Boston, each year they come up with an appropriation to cities and towns in the form of local aid. And a lot of it's based on formulas. And so 2003, uh, we were getting you know, about 50, uh, let's see, about 150, let's see, let me just check the total here, just shy of about 15,400,000 from the state. I believe that's about what the number was. <coughs> that was kind of a high watermark. And then you can see it's gone down, uh, it dipped precipitously. It then started to go back up again to 2008. It never quite got back up to where we were in 2003. And then, of course, we all know that around 2008, 2009, the world, national, and state and local economies all tanked. And you can basically see how state aid uh, has gone down. Over the past five years, we've lost about $3.4 million in state aid over that time period. Uh, but you can see, and another way to look at it is how has that state aid changed as a percentage of our operating revenues over that same 10 years? So you can see that back in, in uh, 2003, state aid represented about 24% of our operating budget. We're now down in, in the uh, current fiscal year that we're in right now to about 12.7%. So about half of those uh, in, in terms of percentage. And of course, we then had to make that up, absorb that either in our either by doing over, the override that I talked about or by making deep cuts in services and in staff uh, to be able to absorb those cuts. Um, so that shows you a trend in terms of state aid and where that has gone. on. In terms of other revenues, uh, we have had some uh, positive signs. This, this is a hotel, motel, and meals tax uh, revenue trend. Um, the, the lower bar, the kind of greenish bar, is hotel, motel. Uh, you can see that's been fairly consistent. You'll notice then in 2010 and 2011, the, the uh, purplish line occurred. That's the meals taxes. In, in that particular uh, budget year, the state passed a local option uh, uh, both for meals tax and for hotel motel. What that meant was cities and towns could vote to add an additional surcharge to the, both the meals tax as well as the hotel motel tax. We did opt to do that in Northampton. The city council voted to do that. And then you can see that those additional revenues have been coming in in 2010 and 2011. And if I had a chart 
a bar to show you 2012, uh, those have been going up as well. We've, we've done, uh, again, it's, it, it, it hasn't helped solve the entire loss of state aid, but at least it's been one other tool that they've given us locally to be able to raise revenue. Uh, but the state constitution restricts cities and towns from raising revenue independent of taxes that are created by, by the state legislature. Um, so I often get lots of suggestions from people who say, you should put a tax on this, or you should add it. We can't. We're not allowed to. Uh, only the state legislature can give us the authority to do that, or they can implement a tax themselves. This is new growth. Uh, new growth is essentially, when we talked about that Proposition 2.5 calculation that we do each year, one of the other ways that we can get above that 2.5% calculation and looking at our overall tax levy is they also let you add in any new growth that occurred that year. So if a new factory was open, new housing that was built, uh, that is looked at as new growth and you're allowed to add that onto the base. Uh, so a lot of times when we talk about economic development in the context of our city budget, that's where it comes in because that is one of the ways that we can expand our, our tax base and we can grow that pie of available revenue. You, again, pretty much mirror some of the earlier slides in terms of the economy. Uh, we were, let's see, 2000, 2003, we were up over $800,000 in, in new growth. Uh, then you can see as we move over to 2000 and 2009, you can basically see where the bubble burst. Uh, people stopped building new homes, uh, things slowed down, credit dried up, and so uh, that number dropped below 400000 we did climb back up a little bit in FY 2012. Um, as you see, we, as you'll see in a minute, we did much better than many other communities in that regard. But it's still been relatively flat. This is that community. This is that comparison to other communities. Again, using those comparison communities, and you can see that for FY 12, uh, our new growth was 654 501, which again was historically low, but we were still doing much better than other communities. Um, we are projecting growth to be a little bit slower this year. We haven't had quite the same amount of growth that we had last year. I think last year was in some ways attributable to Cole Morgan uh, being constructed and that project coming online, as well as some of the other housing that happened up at uh, Village Hill. This is just a quick look at some of the other revenues. And while um, this is a revenue that includes permits, uh, the building inspector, the plumbing inspector, um, while it's not a large amount of money, I did want to show it as, as just to demonstrate how it's cyclical and how it's very dependent on the economy. So you can see in those same years, 2008, 2009, where uh, some of the other housing factors started to go down, permits went down as well. 2010, 2011, what the building inspector is telling us this year is we're probably going to see less revenue this year, even though there's initially <coughs> just as many permits. But people, as, as some of you know, when you take out a permit, it's based on the value of the project. So there's still lots of activity going on. It's just the dollar value of the projects are not quite as high. So we're not, we're, that's an area in the budget where we're going to have to downgrade some of that anticipated revenue. Another chart that should be familiar to everybody, which is uh, the city's interest on, on interest, on, on investments. We do keep money in short term. Uh, instruments uh, because we're constantly moving things around and having to have uh, money on hand. So we, as you can see, uh, again the car goes up to the top of the roller coaster there right at the, at the peak and then basically has fallen off. Um, again, not an insignificant difference though when you think we were earning above $600,000 a year and now we're just about $100,000 a year. Uh, so that's a significant loss of revenue. Uh, in terms of what's available for us to use uh, toward the general fund budget. Those are the revenues. This is just a quick overview of some of the key expenditures. So this is a pie chart that kind of looks again at the general fund and breaks it down into functional areas. Uh, education, 38.6%. That includes the public school, Northampton Public Schools and Smith Boat. Um, the next uh, largest ca category is employee benefits. That's the health care, salaries, uh, retirement, etc. Public safety, that's police, fire, dispatch, uh, building inspections, parking enforcement. Um, and then you can see all of the other uh, functions of government. Culture and recreation, uh, that's like the Arts Council and the Rec Department, 2%. Human services, that's like our Veterans Services Department um, and our health uh, agent. 
Public Works, 4.1%. Uh, general Government, 4.9%. That's all of the, basically the functions that you encounter in City Hall. It's uh, the Mayor, the City Council, the Treasurer, the Auditor. Uh, that's kind of a quick overview, and then you can see some of the smaller areas as well. This is taking it, uh, this is again looking at the focusing in on the education piece. This is looking at education, but in addition to just the, the direct expenditures to the public schools, it also looks at the health benefits, um, the retirement benefits, all the other things that we pay on the city side to the school uh, department uh, to focus in, including the debt service, the service on the various uh, debt projects that they have. So that just shows it in a different way. Um, uh, showing the, how education fits as part of that pie. This is per people spending, another kind of education related one, and, and I've given this presentation to the school committee, and, and again, I think this is an important one to look at, uh, K-12 per people spending. So the FY11 state average is $13,371 per people. Uh, you can see that Northampton, uh, again, in that same fiscal year spent $12,608, and then you can kind of see how we compare to other communities. We're sort of in the middle, of, in that range with those other uh, six or seven communities, and then you've got Amherst Regional and Amherst who are kind of uh, a little bit higher than the rest of us. Again, I think they've done three general overrides uh, during the same period that we've done one general override. So they've been able to uh, raise uh, significantly more revenue, as we'll see at a later point in the slide. Um, this is again focusing on, uh, on the issue of salaries and wages, just focusing on those as a portion of our general fund budget. So if you take salaries and wages, which is 54%, and then you look at the employee benefits and insurance, that's 20%. So those two items together are 74% of our budget. I mean, we are a people organization. We're an organization that delivers services to the community. So if you're uh, in schools, it's teachers and classrooms. Uh, DPW, it's, it's the folks who are plowing your roads, who are fixing your sewers, um, policemen, firemen. Essentially, a, the largest poor part of what we do is, is the employees that, that deliver the services that you depend on. Uh, operating expenditures, again, 14%. This is sort of the operating and maintenance costs within a particular department, aside from the personnel costs. Um, debt service, that's the money, that, that's essentially the debt uh, payments that we make each year on the long-term borrowing that we do for large capital projects, uh, whether it's the police station, whether it's new trucks and equipment, whether it's new uh, cafeteria equipment in schools, whether it's a new roof, any of the things that we have to borrow for, uh, that goes in there. So those are sort of the three large areas, but I wanted to focus in on the salary and wage piece because again, whenever we get into budget difficulties, it's, it, you're trying to make cuts, that's the largest part of the budget, so that typically is where, that's where the money, the savings can be most easily found. Um, let's see, I put in skip one. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, so this, again, is just taking it, same pie chart and looking at it as a bar chart. Again, broken down into those functional areas. In terms of, in terms of growth in any of those areas, pretty, pretty much education and public safety have been sort of the growth areas. Um, of, of the budget, the rest of the categories have, main, maintained, have maintained fairly static over that time. This is medical insurance or health insurance. Again, another, another uh, chart that uh, shouldn't, should be very familiar to people either in their businesses or in their own personal life. This is essentially the cost of what it, of what it takes for us to be able to provide health insurance to our employees. You can again see the trend over the 10 years, FY 2003. Um, all the way over to FY uh, 2011, uh, where again we went from just under $6 million a year to now over $8 million a year. Um, and as some of you may have heard in the news, we got our, um, we got our essentially our renewal quote from Health New England this year, it was 12.5% uh, increase, which is about $1.2 million. Uh, and we have been doing some negotiating with them, we've got the number down to about 8.5%, which is still a $950,000 increase to the budget. Uh, we did, we also um, looked at an alternative plan, uh, which was a, a deductible style plan that would have provided uh, even larger savings. Uh, that one we did have to, I met with what's called the insurance um, 
advisory committee, or IAC, which is made up of all of the heads of the various bargaining units in the city, and we went through both of the plans. They then went back to their membership to discuss it. They voted, and they unanimously came back and made a recommendation that we stick with the current plan, uh, that we not move to the other plan. Um, and so I'm going to respect that recommendation and try to work through with the current plan that we have. Um, again, 8.5% um, uh, increase, but you can sort of see over time, we've done a great job, and I want to definitely tip my hat to Mayor Higgins, who did a lot of work, especially over the last three or four years, to really do what's called plan design changes, which is work, again, with that IAC committee that I just talked about, to make incremental changes to the plan, uh, whether it means raising co-pays or raising deductibles or coming up with reimbursement uh, schemes where if, if a person has to pay a larger deductible, the city will reimburse them for it. So over the last five years, the average has only been about a 2.92% increase, which has been great. Um, and definitely compared to other communities and compared to, uh, to the industry in general, that's been remarkable. Um, the unfortunate <coughs> thing is I, I've inherited now the plan. It's been tweaked to the, to the limit. It can't be tweaked anymore. Um, essentially, all of these plans are plans that are approved by the, um, they have to be approved by the State Insurance Commission. And so we've gone through and pretty much every tweak that could be made has been made. Uh, so there's very little maneuverability. And I can tell you that no other health plan bid on our service this year, um, which again, I think tells you where we are at in terms of our plan and what we're offering. We invited bids from many other, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we you know, pretty much the whole gamut of providers, no one else bid on our service. So we're essentially uh, going to be sticking with Health New England, and we're going to have to absorb that cut. I am going to have one more conversation with the president of Health New England uh, to see if there's any more flexibility. But again, that shows you the healthcare picture. And again, anyone who owns a business here um, or has to deal with health insurance in their own life, this is a major cost driver. And one of the reasons why you know, we need reform around health care uh, nationally, uh, because it, again, it's a big pressure on cities and towns. This is our debt service. Again, this is what I talked about earlier, um, the debt that we encumber on the various projects. I hope you can see the, the delineation in terms of color. Um, the top two lines are, uh, are other sources and MSBA reimbursement. Um, essentially, well, first of all, the top line is basically debt that's reimbursed by the CPA or the Community Development Block Grant. So those are outside sources. So in some cases, um, for example, the Senior Center, we're using Community Development Block Grants to pay some of the debt service on that. So that shows you that. MSBA reimbursement is the uh, Mass School Building Authority. So in Massachusetts, when you build a new school, the state gives you 75% of the borrowing costs. Those of you who've been following East Hampton, they just built a, are in the process of building a new school. And so, that money coming in for debt service is coming in from the state to pay that. The two that are really most important to us and to our bottom line are these lower two. So the, the, this upper one, uh, second to the bottom, is debt excluded. So that's the debt that the voters have voted to allow us to exclude it from Proposition 2 and a half. So we're basically, so that's like the police station that we're building. It's JFK Middle School, it's the high school renovation, it's the fire station. Those are all the debt exclusion projects. And basically, it allow, by excluding it, it means it allows you to exclude us from that two and a half cap, and we're allowed to raise the revenues each year to pay that debt. The lowest portion, that's what we have to put in the budget every year toward debt service. Um, and, and so, you can see that in this upcoming fiscal year, fiscal year 2013, there's a little bit of a spike upward. And again, that's because we're absorbing the first payments on the police station uh, that we have to pick up on the city side. It was a $16 million project. Ten of it was debt excluded. The other $6 million is being paid for by the tax uh, as part of the general fund. So we have to move additional monies over into debt service to be able to cover that. And you can sort of see how the, the debt exclusion ones get smaller. Um, that is as each year, as those debt excluded get paid off, uh, they get smaller and smaller. You can see that it's going to get bigger again for a while and then start to go back down again as we begin to pay off the police station. So that shows you um, the debt exclusion. 
I have to, in, in 2013, we have to put an additional $600,000 of general fund money toward debt exclusion to cover those additional borrowing costs that we've incurred. So that's, that's there to show you that factor. Another big part of the, um, of the education picture, uh, and again, this is another historical chart, is school choice and charter uh, sending tuition. Again, this, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, school choice is when a student decides that they want to leave Northampton and go to East Hampton Public Schools. So we have to pay a tuition, it's $5,000 per student. We have to pay a tuition to that other school district. In the case of charter schools, it's a much higher tuition. They actually have a different formula that they use to assess it. It could be as high as 11, 12, 13, $14,000 per student. But you can see that um, as we look at charter schools and then choice together, that has been a number that's been rapidly increasing over time, particularly as more charter schools have opened here in the region. Uh, and this is funding that comes right off that cherry sheet that I described earlier. So it comes right off the city's uh, local aid uh, money. Uh, so it doesn't come out of the school budget, it comes out of the overall state aid uh, cherry sheet that we get. And again, that's a major factor as we look at that number climb to now over you know, 2.5 million that we have to send out each year. We do get school choice students that come into Northampton as well, so we do collect revenues from other communities. Um, but again, this is a major cost driver uh, as we look at it. <coughs> These are just a couple of other uh, uh, line items in the budget, snow and ice and veterans benefits. I just show them because we have several uh, budget items that are very cyclical. In some cases, they depend on the weather, uh, like snow and ice. So for example, uh, you can see that upward spike. Uh, uh, and I don't show FY, well, FY11 is there. And then if 12 was there, you'd see that spike uh, for the winter that we had last year. We spent an enormous amount uh, last year on snow and ice. This year, we're not going to spend as much. Um, so that's very cyclical. And you can kind of see how that goes over time. This lower line is veterans benefits. Um, and you can essentially see uh, as the number of veterans coming back to Northampton has increased from the uh, two wars, uh, we have had to pay out um, exponentially more veterans benefits over that time to under $100,000 a year in FY 2004 to over $600,000 a year. Now we're required to pay that um, and we do so uh, willingly and because we support veterans in the community and we, we really worked hard to reach out to veterans. We do get reimbursed 75% of it, but it's not until the next year. So we have to put out 100% of the money. We have to budget that. Uh, and again, that's just one of those drivers that has been difficult to predict. And oftentimes, if you watch city council meetings, Steve Connor, our city vet veterans agent, has had to come back to the council several times to say, I've run out of money. I need more money. Uh, for veterans benefits, so we've had to transfer additional money over. This is uh, this is reserves. This is essentially our our bank accounts, our savings accounts. Uh, we essentially have three main ones. We have what's called free cash, um, which I don't know which state bureaucrat came up with that name, free cash. But it obviously uh, it's an interesting. It, people always get a little bit excited when they hear that. Essentially, what free cash is is in a budget, so for example, in this particular budget year, um, at the end of the budget year, the state goes through all of our books and looks at what did we budget, and then what did we actually spend. So if a department had budgeted $100,000, but they only spend 97,000 of that $100,000, uh, by about fall of that year, the state says, this is hereby free cash. It's, it's an excess cash that you're allowed to use and program into other budget areas in the following budget year. Um, we also have what are called stabilization and capital stabilizations. That's where we actually move money into those particular funds, again, as a savings account, as a rainy day fund, so that if we have unforeseen emergencies, whether it's a, a, a bad year for snow, whether it's a, a, a roof that collapses. A couple of years ago, you may remember, we had uh, dangerous amounts of snow on city roofs where we literally had to bring in contractors to remove it because the city engineer was concerned about building collapse. Uh, so those kinds of contingencies, we have to have some money in, in savings. And again, like, like all of us, we want to have some money in savings for those kinds of unforeseen emergencies. But you can see, 
Uh, again, prior to the economic downturn, you know, we had over $4 million, for example, in free cash in some of those budget years. Uh, and you know, upwards of $2 million in the, uh, in the stabilization account. What's happened over time is, as those state aid cuts have happened, we've had to rely on that money. We've had to, we've had to plug that money into the budget to be able to prop up the general fund budget and to avoid layoffs. Uh, and uh, so that's why you can see the precipitous drop uh, in, in what we have in, uh, in free cash. This shows you a comparison. Um, again, looking at those free cash numbers, uh, the stabilization fund being in the kind of chartreuse color and then free cash in red. This is how we compare to other communities in terms of what we have available. Um, it's not only important to have because we need it for fiscal emergencies, but I just went through the, the process with our bond rating agencies uh, where we, um, whenever we go out to borrow, we meet with either Moody's or Standard and & Poor's and they give us a rating. And one of the things they really focus on is how much do you have in these reserves? You know, what's your cash position? What, how much do you have available for some kind of an emergency? And while they allowed us to maintain our bond rating uh, this last time, they did put a note, a negative note, saying that our reserves were, were beginning to be low and that we needed to put together some kind of a plan to address that. So uh, again, you can sort of see where Northampton fits in on the, uh, on the spectrum. This is taking it out statewide and looking where Northampton. So here's Northampton. And we've chosen, again, a statewide look at other communities of our similar size, either population, budgets. So you've got the Gloucesters, the Watertowns, Randolph, Stoughton, Milton. Again, you can see that in terms of where we are, uh, we have you know, less than $2 million on this particular chart in that year compared to many other communities who, in some cases, have upwards of $10 million in free cash, which allows them, again, if they, if they get a cut you know, in state aid, that allows them to be able to absorb that uh, much, much easier. So what are the favorable trends? Uh, we've we've uh, had consistently strong property tax collections. We do not have a lot of delinquencies in terms of uh, people in the community uh, care about the community. They pay their taxes. They have come out to the polls, even in some cases, to raise taxes. We have a relatively low tax rate compared with comparable neighboring communities. That was one of the slides that we saw earlier. We have high property values that have remained high even during the economic downturn. Again, our single family property tax bill is below the state average. We have some revenue uh, streams that are on the upswing, the excise tax for motor vehicles, uh, parking meter and garage, hotel, motel, and meals tax. Again, the bond rating has been very strong. We've, we've worked to keep our insurance and health costs low. Um, Although well, there would obviously be an asterisk this year. But again, we're under 10%, which is what a lot of uh, businesses have seen year to year in terms of their health care costs. So even though we're going to be going up 8.5%, that's not really outside the norm in terms of what people are seeing from year to year. Unfavorable trends. Again, state aid being the biggest. Uh, you can sort of see from FY08 to FY12, we've seen that drop of about 3.5 million in state aid. And again, in FY13, uh, we'll see another reduction. Um, we uh, had the governor's budget that came out at the beginning of the year, which cut us uh, a little bit shy of $200,000. The House has just released a budget which is going to restore some of that state aid. So we may, in fact, see a, a slight net increase in state aid if the House budget holds. Um, and you can again see that 24% to 12.7% over the 10 years. Excess levy capacity, basically what that means is, do we have any more room under the 2.5% cap? And basically, we're taxing right up to the 2.5% cap, or as close as we can get to it, uh, using all the rounding things that they have to do in the assessor's office. Another big one is the interfund operating transfers. We are going to see a decline because the landfill is closing. Uh, that is one of the big interfund operating transfers that we've relied on over time. There used to be a host fee that we would receive. Um, over the last couple of fiscal years, we've, we've sort of weaned the city budget off of that. It's not receiving any more host fee um, in, in this year's budget. And now the next item that we're going to have to deal with in this particular budget is those interfund operating transfers. So again, this is sort of the back office support, the, the billing, the, the uh, um, 
auditor's office, the treasurer's office, the city you know, finance director's office, all the things that goes into helping support that, that enterprise fund, we're going to have to cut that to zero over the next two years as the landfill closes and essentially that particular, um, that particular enterprise fund begins to wind down. New growth, again, is expected to decline in FY13. We're, we're not going to be able to see the same number that we saw last year. Obviously, interest on investments is not really, it's been fairly flat. Health insurance, again, right now we're looking at an 8.5%, 8.25% increase, which is a $950,000 increase overall. Uh, some of our fixed cost debt service, again, that was the number where we have to increase to cover those additional debts. The retirement system, we're going to have to put an additional $200,000 into our retirement system to meet the mandated goals of, of making the system solvent. Uh, things like school choice and charter school, you've seen how that's continuing to rise. Uh, veterans benefits uh, are going up. And then there's the low reserve issue that I talked about. Uh, this is going to be really tricky to read because it's a little bit small, but I'll just give you a quick overview. This is a chart that I basically started getting to the city council pretty much on an every meeting basis, which is giving them kind of a quick overview of all the different moving pieces of the budget as I'm trying to put it together. And again, it's been changing as we get different health care quotes. It changes when we saw the governor's budget to most recently when we saw the house budget. Um, but basically, you can see, it starts right at the top. That's the 2.5% increase. So we're allowed to raise this year a little over a million dollars in new revenues under Proposition 2.5. We're going to put in about 475000 in new growth. That's, again, what we're estimating. Then there's the debt exclusions that we have. Um, and then that basically brings us to about $2.3 million that we can expect in, in revenues. Then we have to look at all the other potential revenue items like parking meters, uh, collector's fees, other changes that we are uh, uh, forecasting, like we're looking at permits and inspection fees going down. Uh, we're looking at parking tickets uh, going down because they've been down this year, so we have to try to go with the information that we have historically. You can see state aid, we are showing an increase. Uh, that's based on the number that was put out by the House Ways and Means Committee at the end of last week. So what we're showing is potentially a net increase of 218412 um, We're not going to get less money for Medicaid this year. Here's that solid waste enterprise fund where we're going to basically have to go down or, 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 or reduce um, the expected revenue by 183648 from the solid waste enterprise fund. Uh, so again, when you come down and factor in all these others, we're looking at total new revenues of about 2.3 million. Then you go over to the various cost increases that we're looking at. There's that debt service increase. Uh, that's the existing debt plus all the new debt that we have to pay off. Uh, health insurance increase at eight and a quarter percent. Uh, projections in other areas like veterans benefits, retirement, snow and ice, um, unemployment and Medicare taxes. Um, and you'll notice there's a, a custodial staff for the new police station, which we have to factor in. So our total fixed cost in increases are about 2.65 uh, million, uh, which gives us a gap uh, of about 338,162. You may have read in the paper over the weekend that the school department, the school committee, is also facing a significant gap as well in terms of their budget. Um, and they're actually looking at potential layoffs uh, because they need to be able to, uh, uh, to, to meet their payroll. Given I, I, I gave all of our city departments level funding instructions to begin to build their budgets, even though we're not quite at level funding as I look at the, at the picture today. But I wanted them to use that as a starting point. So one of the other pieces of news that came out from the House uh, of Representatives on Friday was that in addition to local aid, they were also going to be increasing the Chapter 70 program, which is aid to schools. And they were going to make a commitment to try to give an additional, I think, $40 per student to every kid in Massachusetts. Uh, so we have uh, taken that information, which is about $111,000 um, uh, for Northampton Public Schools, it's about $4,900 for Smith Vogue. In addition to that, I'm trying to move some additional monies over to the school side to be able to give them about $208,000 additionally. Again, that's based on the numbers that I have today to help them avoid some of the teacher layoffs 
that they would be otherwise facing. Um, so, so the budget gap that we're dealing with as of today, looking at all those different factors, is about $551,082 uh, that we're going to be spending the next two weeks uh, between these meetings with the public and the meetings that I'm having with department heads to really pour through their budgets to try to figure out where are their items that we can save additional money to get that down essentially to zero into a balanced budget that I can then present to the city council the first meeting in May. So uh, again, this is just a quick summary of the things we've just talked about. Um, this actually is actually an old slide because it says, will the 268 be restored? And they have restored some of that, so that question has been answered. Um, and again, it just kind of highlights some of the issues uh, that we've been talking about. So essentially, what I wanted to talk to you about, and these are just some, some ideas for discussion, uh, you know, what programs and services should be our top priorities in a fiscally constrained budget? What suggestions do you have for reducing expenses? What ideas do you have for increasing revenue? And then just any other comments and questions uh, that people have. And I'm happy to open up the floor and, and hear ideas or answer questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering, uh, Northampton, the Northampton school system is an excellent school system. We have excellent teachers, excellent programs. Um, why are parents, why do parents feel that they have to send their children out of town to go to school and if they feel so strongly about it, why should the taxpayers have to pay for that? So I, I know that this is one of the issues that the new superintendent has really been looking at in terms of trying to do, um, you know, trying to meet with parents that are leaving the system to interview them, to do exit interviews, if you will, to try to find out what are the issues, what are the things. I know a few years ago there were a number of issues regarding people that were leaving because of arts and music and theater programming at the high school, for example. So I know there was an effort to try to beef up some of those programs, and we've, and we've seen some of the results of that. Um, in terms of the funding structure, uh, you know, the charter school system uh, was conceived, you know, it's a, national, it's a national idea that's been looked at in other parts of the country. Uh, primarily, I think it was originally conceived in sort of inner city uh, areas where you had really failing school districts, and so it was an idea to try to, I think, create more competition, more accountability. Um, and as it's then been adopted by various states, I know one of the big bones of contention with regard to charter schools, for example, here in Massachusetts, has been the fact that, again, it's essentially set up by the state, it's chartered by the state, um, there's no school committee oversight, for example. There's no elected body that oversees it. And obviously the funding mechanism has been controversial because it's money that comes right off of uh, cities and towns. So there's been a debate about the funding structure and should it be funded directly by the state or should we do it through this assessment program? Because obviously, you know, in Northampton, we've got four or five charter schools around us. So we have a lot of different places for people to go. Uh, there may be other communities that don't have that option near them, so there's, a, there's some equity issues there. Uh, but it is it has been an issue of debate. Uh, the vice chair of the school committee is here tonight, Stephanie Pick, and we served last when I was city councilor on a joint committee. We actually met with charter school officials, and we also met with state officials and had quite an interesting debate about the various complexities of the issue. Um, and again, I think parents make are making choices um, based on what they think is in the best interest of their kids, and I certainly respect that. But obviously, um, it has an impact on us here uh, uh, in terms of the, the main public school system. So I know that we need to try to figure out a way to, to work through that. And there's different bills in the legislature to try to address, address the problem. But I know the superintendent's goal has been, the new superintendent's goal has been to find out why parents are leaving. And also, I think, to try to really, I think, do a better job of promoting the school and letting people know. I know he's got a, an initiative on right now to really revamp the school's website, and he's got a new blog, and he's, got, he's trying to get more information out to the greater Northampton community about the strength of our schools. I have two daughters who come through the schools that have gone to the elementary schools. They're now in the middle school. My oldest daughter, who just poked her head in the door and then left, is going to high school. There she is. Ellen's right there. Uh, and uh, she's going to high school next year. So we do have great schools, and I think we, in some senses, we have to do a better job of, of, um, of talking about them. But obviously, when we 
year to year have these budget situations, I think that also creates a lot of anxiety for parents um, and may also be part of that. Um, I had a couple of hand in the back, two hands in the back, and then I'll get right to you. So, yes, just to clarify the numbers, because I'm, I'm not clear about that, uh, it seemed like this, the city spends about $12,000 a year per student, but then you mentioned an $11,000 payment for a charter school student that goes elsewhere or a $5,000 payment when they go to another city. So are we looking at a net loss on a student leaving the community? We, we end up uh, on the school choice side, we do better, we, we net money on the school choice side. So we do get additional money on the school choice side. We obviously lose money on the... On the um, we take care of we do, we do take in more than, we do actually receive more money in that transaction. Um, but it, again, seemed, it seemed like that was the case for the charter school as well, or is it 12,000 and then 11,000? You, 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 you had one chart that said that yeah. we spend, or I wasn't sure what it was, spend or or yeah, the the charter charter each, each charter school a sets a different tuition. So the state actually sets the tuition for each charter school, and they use a different formula based on a number of factors about that charter school. So the price for PDPA versus the Chinese immersion versus, it's a different tuition. But it is a net loss per student that goes to charter school. Uh, it's an, on the charter school side, yes. The overall school choice, charter school issue, we do bring in, at the end of the game, we have more kids coming to Northampton on school choice than are leaving on school choice. Uh, but we are, as that charter school number increases, and again, this. I think this speaks to the inequity issue. If you're a kid that wants to leave Northampton and go to the East Hampton Public Schools, the state only gives you five thousand dollars. Right, but I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking from a from an economic standpoint. Yeah. If the, the lady over here is suggesting that it would be important to convince students to stay in yeah. our schools, but yes. does that really become revenue positive if we do that? If, if less students went to the charter school, most definitely yes. Because that money would, uh, the school choice program is a sort of its own little program, and then the charter school program is a separate program. And definitely, if less kids went to charter school, that number, that, that sharp increase that you see each year would start to go down. And that would be more revenue that would be available to the city. Um, so, definitely. Uh, and then, ma'am, you, and then. I, I just had a comment. Um, and, and that is involves education and, and the educational services that are offered in Northampton. I'd like to see consistent support for education in Northampton. Um, I think that one of the most demoralizing things that happens every April, we read about layoffs, potential people who are getting pay slipped, and I'm thinking, does this happen at the fire station? Does this happen at the police station? Does this happen in the assessor's office? And I'm thinking, this is terrible for someone who is still planning on working for three more months with her, his, his class, to all of a sudden receive a pizza up and have to think about, what am I going to be doing next year? Or the principal has to decide, how am I going to configure my classes next year? And I, and, I, and I know that that involves putting more money into the system, but I think if we put more money into the system, parents are going to be looking at the Northampton schools and saying, oh yeah, this is a better place than it was two years ago. I do want my child to go to elementary school, JFK, or high school. And I think the increase in support can only create a, a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and to that point, I, 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 you mentioned the whole layoff issue. In fact, well, part of that is driven by contract. So your, the superintendent is required under the contract to give notice by a certain date. It generally falls in April. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if they don't have the funding to be able to guarantee that person their job, they have to do the layoff uh, routine that, that happens every year in many cases. I know that the superintendent announced at the meeting, uh, the school committee meeting last week, because, again, these new house numbers were and I was telling him that I think we may have extra money. He did get permission from the union president to delay those layoff notices for two more weeks, which I'm grateful to her for because, again, giving someone a pink slip and then having them go through that anxiety, they're, 
my kids have been through that situation where their teacher got a pink slip, and they're like, Dad, are they really going to lay off Mr. So-and-so? Or, you know, and it's, it's a lot of anxiety, not only for the teacher, but for parents, students. And so again, if we can try to avert that, we're doing everything we can to do it. Last year, we had a very similar situation where many of you remember the stimulus funds that we received, that, that many cities and towns received. Uh, that ran out last mm -hmm. year. And so the city, the school department particularly, was facing a huge gap because those federal funds had all gone away. And so last year's budget, uh, the mayor, then Mayor Higgins, allocated an additional, I think, 3% toward the schools to be able to make up that gap so that they wouldn't have to make the kinds of deep layoffs that would have been required. So again, we're, it's a, it's a, it's a strange way that we make our budgets at the local level because we're trying to make our budgets based on state aid numbers that won't be finalized until the end of June. So we're kind of trying to read the tea leaves. The governor puts out his budget. The House puts out their budget. We're still waiting for the Senate to put out their budget. And then somehow they all have to come together and give us what that final number is. So I regret the anxiety, and I wish we had the resources. And again, some of this gets back to those larger fiscal policies at the state level where um, I think someone mentioned why don't we have a more reliable number coming every year from the state. And again, I think it's the way the state budgets are built and the way revenues are shared between the state and cities and towns. Um, and again, there, there, there's a new study that just came out um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's called the tax expenditure budget, which is a little known part of the state budget, uh, which are essentially the collection of tax breaks that have been put into the state budget over time. Uh, for various industries, for this manufacturer, for that manufacturer, for the film industry. Um, and essentially, these have been allowed to accumulate over time. And in the last year's budget, they inserted something that said, you have to put together a task force to really look at this and figure out what it, what it entails. Well, basically, I think it's about $26 billion in this year's budget, which they have to show as part of the tax expenditure budget, which will basically be tax breaks for various interests for various companies. Now look at that $26 billion in the context of cities and towns get about $5 billion from the state. So that's an area right there where if they're serious and they really look at some of these issues and say, we don't need to give, you know, we're never going to be Hollywood, so why are we trying to give tax breaks to the film industry, for example? Uh, or why don't we just invest that money in cities and towns where really we're going to see the most growth in terms of local economies, in terms of education, the kinds of things that will really build a strong economy in the state. So that's one thing I would look at, is we have to keep lobbying our state leaders to try to come up with a more progressive tax system, a more rational tax system, so that we get a greater share of the dollars back here in our county. So that meals tax that's coming in, is that percentage of that that goes to education? Or does it just go wherever? It, it comes into the general fund budget, yes. uh, and we try to allocate it accordingly. Um, so you're asking me about education. I was at a, a parking meeting earlier today where some angry restaurateurs and business people were telling me what for about parking prices. And they were saying, you know, you already raised our meals taxes. You already raised. So it's a debate about how to, where that money should go. And we're trying to make sure that it just goes into the general budget to try to fill whatever gaps we have. So we haven't allocated it to any one specific area. Uh, but again, we're just trying to figure out any local revenue sources that we have to try to be able to grow our budget. And economic development is a big part of that as well. So the development that we're starting to see now on King Street, where old shopping plazas are being redeveloped, that's going to be potentially new tax revenue that will be added on to the levy that will mean more money for us to be able to fill some of these needs here locally. Um, you had a question now, or a comment. Well, just to kind of... Um back on the question about uh, education. You know, the question was why people are leaving. And I think Northampton historically has a good reputation, and my children are in Northampton schools now, but I have to say, every year with cuts and increasing class size, it does cause a parent to look outside of the city to meet the needs of their children. And I think, similar to what you're saying, if the city doesn't put more into education, that trend is just going to continue. Because people can look even to a school district next door and see a better building, better technology, lower class ratios, and, then, and these are not specialized programs. These are the core of academic instruction with competing towns. And then on top 
of it to have the choice of all the different charter schools that would be offering additional things in addition to the small class size and maybe more stable staffing where people wouldn't, you wouldn't have to have your teacher leave every year. Yeah. I, I think if the city doesn't change how it prioritizes education, that can be good. Your point's well taken, although again, I refer you back to the pie chart in terms of, you know, about 53% of our money is going to, we, we, we're, we're trying to allocate a lot of money to the schools every year, but we also have to look at, you know, we also have to provide fire protection, we have to provide police protection, uh, we have to, you know, I look at that DPW number, I look at our city engineer, Jim Marilla, who's here, you look at what we spend on our DPW um, compared to other communities, and again, that's a, that's an area that we've really, I think, underfunded over time as well. Um, it's probably taping that right now, but uh, it'll be on tape. But again, when you look at public works, people talk to me. I was uh, at the diner before I came here, and someone said, you know, hi, Mayor, when are you going to fix the road? It's in terrible shape. Uh, again, that's an investment that people want as well. So there's a lot of competing priorities. But I, you know, your point is well taken. The schools are important, and we've traditionally, I think, in Northampton, prioritized them. But when you look at that 10-year trend of all the forces that are kind of going against us in terms of state aid going down, uh, the economy going down, it's been difficult uh, to, try to, to try to keep it afloat. So I'm doing what I can in this budget year to try to avoid teacher layoffs. But I think it's part of a larger conversation we need to be having about how the state funds education and how, how they fund cities and towns. Um, so I, you know, I'm hoping I can get the help of the community to help go to Boston and try to make that case to the state legislature about some of these formulas that they use to send us money back. I mean, they're they're like patting themselves on the back. We're giving kids an extra forty dollars a year to cities and towns you know, per kid to cities and towns after we've basically been flatlining them for the last four or five years. Um, so you know that that's that's a big piece of it as well. The support that we receive uh, for our tax dollars that we send to Boston because we really I mean we've we've raised our we've raised our property taxes. When we when we needed to, but we can't do that every year. We just can't do that because it'll just make more Northampton difficult for people to live in, in terms of cost of living. So that's a you know a fail state, but it's not something we can rely on sustainably over time. Uh, Mr. Shanahan, and then the gentleman. <coughs> following up on that comment, one of the earlier charts uh, compared uh, property that property values with uh, other communities and tax rates with other communities. Northampton ranks quite high in terms of property valuation, but pretty much down at the low end to bottom yep. uh, with, with the, in terms of tax rate. So how do you reconcile those two things? Uh, uh, we're closer to some communities in value, but not so close in terms of tax rate. Well, as it turns out, we have uh, with us tonight the Ward 5 City Councilor David Murphy, uh, who's also a former longtime assessor. Uh, and I can just see him, I can see the wheels turning. So, uh, Councilor Murphy, do you want to take the first crack at this? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy to because if you have high property values, you can use a lower tax rate and ratio to generate the money you need. So, communities that have low property values, op operating expenses between communities are very similar. If you have a community with low property values and it costs about as much to operate that community as it does Northampton, you have to use a higher rate to collect the money you need to run the city. Does that make sense? So if the property values are low, you have to charge more per thousand to collect what you need to run your community. So high values can get a lower rate to collect the same money. So the tax bill may have parity, but where you have high values, you can have slightly lower rates. You have low values and higher rates. You go to West Hampton and they're collecting over $16 a thousand to run a much smaller community because they don't have things to tax. The other thing that you have to watch out for in places like West Springfield, if you're using a residential tax rate, they have a split rate where they charge more for commercial, so does Holyoke. So you're, it's hard to compare the residential rate to the residential rate when they're charging twice as much to their businesses. Now some communities can get away with that because they have big infrastructure businesses that can't go anywhere. But in Northampton, you know, perhaps with the exception of Cole Morgan and, and maybe and Coke, we have small businesses. And with small businesses, the taxes are passed on from the landlord 
to the shop operators. So in, in Northampton, for say, the Main Street building owners are passing on a proportion of the tax to the person selling posters and jelly beans. So they don't actually pay it. The small business person pays it, and the small business person can give up or move to another community. So Cole Morgan's not going to leave their big, Coke's not going to leave their big, but somebody small could leave. So it, it, it's hard. You know, high value, low rate collects the same money as uh, low value, high rate. We're lucky in that we have high property values, but there's a lot of parity in what people pay annually for taxes. It's just which which do you have? A lot of value in a lower rate or limited value in a higher rate? Because you've got to pay your teachers about the same, your police and fire and DPW about the same. So in the end, it, the, the levies might be similar, but sometimes the rate versus the value is not. But that the overall sense. number that we're allowed to tax, yeah. the total value of our property, that's set by the state. The dollar is set anyhow. We don't yeah. collect so yeah. much in taxes. Yeah. Right. So, so it doesn't mean we can have a high rate or a low rate, and these are valuations. Yeah. So the levy is controlled by Proposition 2.5. And, yeah. and the tax rate, the values can go wherever they want. The rate collects the same levy. So if our values in Northampton next year mysteriously drop in half, the tax rate would double to collect the same amount of levy controlled by Proposition 2.5. Uh, it's and, and hmm? terrible. well, it's the reality of municipal government in Massachusetts. And again, you know, the state controls this. What our values are must be certified by the State Department of Revenue. Our levy must be certified by the State Department of Revenue before we can send a tax rate. The Commonwealth controls all of this down to minute detail. And that's doing business as a community in Massachusetts. You know, the state really does have control of everything, and, and the 351 cities and towns play within the rules set up by the state. But if, if they don't approve our values, and they don't approve our levy, we can't send a tax bill. They've got to stamp everything off before you get that tax bill. It's very strictly controlled. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, did that answer your question? <laughs> I'll have to think about it. Okay. <laughs> You allow follow-ups. Yes. So just out of curiosity, it seems like the largest downward trend in the revenue side of the budget is the state aid, which is decreasing. Yes. And to what extent are is Northampton as a individual town or the collectively the three hundred so towns of Massachusetts, how effective are they or we being at lobbying state government to increase that? amount of aid, is it possible that that's a place where resources could be better spent in, um, in trying to get more out of the state pie? Because you already mentioned that one, that one very large amount of money that the state is budgeting, which would tend to work against funding for towns and cities. The tax expenditure budget, yeah. I mean, so there, are, there, is, there is organization among cities and towns. Uh, there's something called the Mass Municipal Association, which is kind of a... Uh, Sort of a lobbying arm, if you will, of cities and towns, uh, where we uh, we work collectively. The mayor, city councilors. There's also a school committee association uh, where we work to try to to try to um, submit testimony and lobby legislators about um, bills or or structural changes that are would, would benefit cities and towns. There are also a lot of local groups that are working on this issue. Uh, there's a group called One Massachusetts, which is again a coalition of a lot of different people that are affected by state budgets that are doing a lot of lobbying. Right here in Northampton, we have a group called Yes Northampton, which started as a group that worked on an override, but has continued beyond the override to be that kind of a lobbying arm. Um, and so they're, they're interacting with fellow folks in other communities to try to work on things. Last year, that same joint committee that I talked about with the vice chair of the school committee, we we got our city council and our school committee in concert with school committees and city councils around the state to pass resolutions urging the state legislature to adopt a change in the state um, income tax system, which was going to increase, make some changes to the um, uh, earned income child credit, which would have tried to put some more progressivity into the tax code. We lobbied, we lobbied. We, we actually took buses and went to the state house and testified before the, the joint revenue committee about that. Um, unfortunately, the, the difficulty has been, and 
this actually <clears throat> the House released its budget on Friday. They nixed several of the tax proposals that the governor had put in on cigarettes and I think he had some taxes on uh, soda or candy or things like that. They've eliminated them and the speaker has said taxes are off the table. You know, we're, we were just not going to talk about taxes. So, you know, when you've got a structural problem and you can't raise revenues, I mean, they're looking at casino gambling as one of their solutions to increasing revenue. Um, but that's going to be a long ways off and we don't know whether it's going to be for real or whether it's going to be, you know, some, some short-term jobs, what the revenue is going to be. Um, so there are, there are lobbying efforts on, but I mean, if you're a, a parent or a concern, concerned citizen, you know, drop a line to our state reps and state legislatures and let them know how important it is that those numbers in the budget be looked at. I mean, Peter cocott has been great, our local state rep, and Stan Rosenberg, you know, they, they met with many of these groups that I've talked about and, and come to forums that we've organized, and they're working to do what they can, but again, there's 351 cities and towns, and you've got, uh, you know, a lot of interest array across the state. A lot of times, they have bigger, more well-paid lobbyists than we have, uh, probably in some cases to fight to retain some of those tax uh, breaks that I described earlier. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's going to be um, an ongoing struggle that we're going to have to just stay engaged in. Are there other comments or questions? Yeah, so, um, Dave Reed from Northampton Media. You mentioned DPW, so it took the steam out of my question. But uh, uh, I've gone to a lot of those meetings there and listened to the Board of Public Works members complain about the deteriorating roads, the backlog that they have, millions of dollars, and $20 million in road repair that, that needs to be done. Uh, the sewer pipes are crumbling, the water pipes. Now they have enterprise funds and they're raising the fees, mm -hmm. which is something every homeowner um, or user is, is uh, seeing on their bills. Uh, there's also a huge amount of money that needs to be spent on flood control to protect the city from, from uh, the Connecticut River flooding if we don't meet these new standards. And other standards uh, at the uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, you know, we're going to see in insurance rates downtown go up and all the rest. Meanwhile, there's this project that's been on the boards for a few years to uh, consolidate the DPW departments and some central services up at the old yards where if people think that some of the schools are in bad shape, they should go up to the DPW. It's, it's deplorable condition and we're operating on the trial uh, Mayor Higgins gave a big presentation. Uh, what's the status of that? project? Is that on the, the back burner for another couple of years? And, and how do you grapple with all these, with a budget squeeze that you're showing? How do you even start to tackle these infrastructure problems that every citizen in the city faces part, you know, every, every day? Uh, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of, uh, so I've been waking up in the middle of the night and trying to think about this stuff. It, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot of long-term stuff to think about the flood control issue we just had a meeting uh, with the city engineer and the DPW director. That's a whole other, you know, we have, we have great infrastructure that people hundreds of years ago had the foresight to build, but it was hundreds of years ago and we need to maintain it. So, you know, some of us for the very first time during the, uh, during the, the storm uh, last year saw those floodgates go up on West Street and probably many people didn't even realize that that system existed, that we had this whole levy system that the Mill River had flooded downtown to the point years ago where we had the, the Corps of Engineers diverted the river, we put in these flood control systems, we have other systems for the Connecticut River, this stuff is all aging and we have to make investments in it. Um, so it's this balancing act between the short and the long term stuff. Some of that you see reflected in the long term borrowing that's part of this budget where we do try to make a certain amount of capital investment every year. So on the DPW, and yes, the, the backlog of roads is, is big. I know that they have a program that tracks all this stuff. It's about 24 to $26 million. If we wanted to fix all the deficiencies tomorrow, that's what we need to do it with. Um, whereas in terms of what we have available, what the state gives us for Chapter 9 each year, we could do about one street a year, maybe one or two streets a year. So this year, we're going to finally get to North Street. Last year, it was Con Street. Uh, we try to prioritize for the most heavily traveled roads. Uh, we try to combine it with other infrastructure projects that are happening at the same time. So yeah, that's a big issue uh, that we have to put aside money, have the discipline to say we want to put aside money for capital projects. 
it just becomes very difficult in a year like this year where you're saying, you know, do we do that or do we try to save a job? Um, the DBW facility, again, this is a project that is definitely needed. Uh, anyone who's ever been up to the DPW, they're working out of an 1800s trolley barn uh, that uh, has poor ventilation, you know, it's not up to state codes, it's, uh, you name it, it's just a deplorable place to have to work. They've done great work working under those conditions, but there has been a long range uh, committee that's been looking at how do we build a new facility at some point to get them into a, into a proper facility and maybe save money by consolidating operations. So, there was a small uh, committee that's been working on this project. We did allocate some money a couple of years ago to hire an architect to begin a design process. Uh, that has now reached kind of almost its conclusion. Uh, it had been scheduled uh, to try to begin construction on it, potentially in this fiscal year or the next. Um, but there was a lot of other factors that played into that. The police station, for example, was supposed to have been built three or four years ago. Uh, that was ready to go, and then we hit the bad economy, and we had to put that project on the shelf for two years. Uh, so now that's been completed. We're now starting to absorb the debt from that. What I've said to the DPW director um, and to some of the board members is we can't do it in this particular budget year. That's pretty much, I'm not going to bring it forward because we cannot absorb that on top of having to absorb the other increases that we have to pay for in the capital project. So one of the things I'm, I'm going to be doing as soon as we get through this month is I want to expand that building committee. Right now it consists of members of the DPW staff as well as the Board of Public Works members. I want to add some additional citizens to that. I want to add some city councilors to it. And I really want to start a larger public conversation in this time that we have where we sort of put it on hold for this year to reevaluate. So I want to have a broader public conversation about the need for that building and how important it is and try to get people up there to see the building. Um, and also, frankly, look at the design that they've come up with and figure out if that is the best way to move forward, if there's ways we can save money. So that's sort of my thinking on the, on the DPW facility project. I've told the people up there when I've met with them that, I, that there's a need for it and we need to try to figure out a way to do it. But again, we're talking about all the different competing issues that we've outlined uh, that we have to try to balance out the short-term versus long-term investments. So we're going to try to keep working on it uh, and, and make the investments that we can. This year, you know, I think we got a little more money from Chapter 90. Uh, again, in many cases, there are restoring cuts that were made a couple of years ago, but we're still not receiving the kinds of aid for that kind of infrastructure. I was at a regional meeting a week or so ago, the Pioneer Valley. Uh, Planning Commission hosted it, and it featured both PDPC, Department of Transportation, the, um, the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority, and they were talking about regional transportation needs and the fact that things like the Big Dig uh, just sucked money away from smaller regions like Western Mass. So much money was being funneled, state money, into that project that really the kinds of infrastructure backlog that we have in Northampton is sort of endemic to the whole region. So they were actually putting forth an idea to the state legislature about looking at what some other regions around the country have done, which is to say to the state legislature, give us the ability as a region to try to put in place some kinds of uh, surge charges or, or things like that that we can devote to regional transportation projects so that we can try to figure out how to provide you know, bus service for people, how we can try to provide fixed roads and off ramps. Because it's not just our streets, it's 91. It's, it's bridges, it's the mass plug, it's, 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 it's system-wide where we have to make these investments. So it's a conversation that's happening at the regional level as well, and they're trying to get interest in the state government in terms of looking at what other communities have done. So out, I think in Colorado, uh, there was a city or a community that, that uh, invested in light rail, and they imposed, I think it was a fee based on road miles traveled or something like that as a way to try to create a funding stream to support light rail. Uh, and so th that model has been used in other parts of the country, so they're trying to spark a conversation about it here as well. The gas tax was supposed to pay for some of these things, um, uh, but we always we haven't actually seen as much of that money uh, as we were promised. So I think there's a credibility issue that's probably the big thing that, that hurts us in that area at the state level in terms of Programs are set up, lottery is set up, and it's supposed to be the, 
the savior of cities and towns, uh, and then times get tough and suddenly they don't send us all the lottery money. Um, but we still have to balance our budget. So it's a longer conversation, but your points are well taken, and I want to try to get out and, and talk about that, those larger infrastructure issues. We're going to be getting a report on our stormwater, which is one of the issues. We have, a, we have an engineering firm, uh, firm looking at our stormwater uh, issues and what that price tag might look like. Uh, so there's a lot of long-term things that we're going to have to grapple with. Oh, just to follow up on that, I mean, and this is a national trend as well, but you, you saw our sources of revenue, property taxes, excise taxes, fees, the state upped the meals tax a little with a local option, but they upped some for themselves as well. Um, so we have li very limited sources of revenue, but back in the 70s, you know, the early 70s, the state used to pick up a lot more special ed than they do now. 766 comes along and we have to pay for that. So you know, it's really hard sometimes to feel like the state treats cities and towns as equal partners in government. They're very happy to give us services to provide, but they really restrict our revenue. Chapter 90, the gas tax, that's all, you know, the Turnpike Authority was gutted to help pay for the big day. It, we don't get the Chapter 90, we don't get the Chapter 70 school aid we used to get. You know, it's very, very hard to provide services when you don't have the basic sources of revenue to cover everything you need to do, the state sort of plays central bank, but when they get in trouble too, well then they're not obligated. The, the Quinn Bill is an example of that. State law, educational benefits for police officers. If they don't have the money to pay their half, they just don't pay it. And they leave you with contractual obligations that, you know, that they do that all the time. And it really gets you very frustrated as a, as a local official to say, we have all of these obligations, we can only raise funds in ways that you say we can, you don't know, you know, you just don't have to pay us if you don't have the money. I mean, we were in a revenue, revenue deficit two years ago because they didn't send us the money. Yeah, mid-year they said, they just said oh, we're sorry, not gonna, we're not going to give it to you. You're not going to get it. And then the next year, Department of Revenue kicks our butt, says, oh, you're in a revenue deficit. In addition to being short this year, you have to make up last year the money we didn't send you. And it's almost like you're dealing, you're dealing with a schizophrenic government 100 miles away that plays by whatever sets of rules they want to make up, it's very hard. And, I mean, a, a chunk of the sales tax is dedicated to the MBTA, which doesn't do us any good. You know, it, 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 it's really, really hard when you're in a, a more rural environment where you can only do so much with public transportation, uh, and, and yet it gets focused towards more metro areas. And I guess, having grown up in Western Mass, I'm used to the fact that when they drop a pot of money on Boston, very little of it splashes this far west. But it's really hard to come to meetings like this and say, it you know, makes us crazy too that the rules change as the year goes on, but you're still had, held to having a balanced budget even when they don't send you what they promise you when you submit your original budget. It, it, it's, it's very frustrating. So are there any other questions or comments or ideas or thoughts that people have about We're going to be continuing to do this all next week. I have meetings every night next week um, in various, all the elementary schools trying to meet with people in different parts of the city just to kind of show them the context of what we're dealing with and what we're trying to do. And I will say on the city side, uh, we are, some of the things that we're doing to make that deficit go down is I'm, I'm looking at eliminating positions on the city side. Um, so if you've heard that I've been doing, taking a look at the parking department, reorganizing the parking department, I'm going to probably eliminating some positions there to save money. I'm looking at positions that have come vacant that I'm not going to fill, again, and try to save money. So we're try I'm trying to do these things on the city side to come up with the cost savings to, to close that gap. And again, on the school side, I know the superintendent is working with his business manager to work on the same issues, and we're talking on an almost daily basis about their numbers and how we can try to help the schools um, get to balance so they don't have to lay off teachers uh, this year. So. That's what we're working on. All of this information is going to be available on the website. You can email me at mayor at martinhamptonma.gov. You can call my office if you have ideas, if you have questions, uh, send them along. And then my budget will then go to the city council the first meeting in May, and then they will have deliberations and hearings, um, and they'll meet with individual departments. So there's a whole other phase of this process that will happen in the month of May. And then in June, they have to take two votes on it to get it enacted. 
So thank you all for coming out tonight, and uh, I'll stick around if you have a specific question.